about that because when you got up today, in fact, when you get up tomorrow, most of you are not going to be thinking, wouldn't it be nice to be poor? And I, I submit to you that I, I believe that the poor are intimidating to us. I'm saying us because I'm one of you. What's happened is we've worked very hard to not be poor. And, and so it's hard to think about them. And I had a simple solution. You know, let the bum get a job. It's America, opportunity. But then you have to, as I, as I took that position, God took me further. And, and the question is, what does that have to do with the child who was born to a crack-addicted, HIV-infected mother in Harlem Hospital yesterday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon have to do with getting a job? And it is, that's all our situation. We're all involved in that. God so loved the world that he did this great work of sending his son. And, and I, I struggled with these things because, you know, I mean, uh, the issues of systemic justice, of things that are wrong, I mean, I didn't do them. But evidently God cares about these things. And, and what I want to talk about, the poor are not a problem to be solved. That's not what's going on. And if I can do anything today, I'm praying, and I'm going to pray right now and ask God to help you see this, something you haven't seen before, that I believe God sent me here this morning to deliver this message to you because he loves you. And Father, I ask you right now in Jesus' name to prepare our hearts that they might be good soil. Lord, the seed, the incorruptible seed, the word of God that would be planted in our hearts today would bear much fruit. God, it's our desire because we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. The poor are not a problem to be solved, but I submit to you. This is, my, this is what I understand from the word, and I'll show you today. The poor are a portal. A portal is a doorway to the heart of God. They're not the problem. And, and, and we say, well, the poor we're going to have with us always. What, the heck, why should we even worry about it? I mean, you know, we pay taxes. But what I'm here to tell you is that it's a doorway, it's a place where what you want, the very desires God put in your heart, I'm going to show you a different way to get to them because to go to the heart of God is to get everything you want. And God cares so much about the poor. When I, I read um, Rick Warren when he returned from Africa, he went over there and, and how his life was changed, he, he, he wrote that book, you know, the... Everybody knows. You see, it's the biggest selling book, you know, second only to the Bible or something. A powerful book, The Purpose Driven Life, The Purpose Driven Church. But he went over there and met someone out in the bush who didn't have anything preaching the gospel and seeing it work. And he came back and he said these words. He says, I don't know how I could have gotten two degrees from the seminary and studied all these years and pastored and missed the 2,000 scriptures about the poor. They're not a problem. And, and you know, I, I, I'd say to you that, you know, in the Bible it says that goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life in Psalm 23. But I got news for you. So will guilt and condemnation. They're always there. They're right there to accommodate you. You know, you do a little bit of good and then you screw up and kick the dog and, you know, get mad at somebody and, you, you know, and, and right after you read the Bible, too. You ever have that happen? <laughs> Man, that's a discouraging deal, isn't it? And, 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 and the enemy of it, you know, you read your Bible for, you know, 15 minutes. Boy, you got into the Word. And, but, you know, the enemy's right there. He said, well, if you really love God, you would have read 30 minutes. Start reading at 30 minutes. Next thing you know, well, if you really love God, if you're dedicated, you'd been reading an hour. That voice is not God's voice. He's drawing you to himself, but it's never through guilt and condemnation. And I just find it's all around me. It's always available but you don't have to accept it. Luke 4, the first recorded message of Jesus Christ. Went to the synagogue, as they did as a practice. And in my neighborhood, you see them walking. On yesterday morning, they were families going. We have three synagogues in our, in our immediate area, neighborhood. And that's why we have such a large Orthodox Jewish community there in Elizabeth, New Jersey. It's always challenged me when I see them walking, the fathers with their sons, walking. Walking. Where? To go to, to meet God. 
So Jesus was in the synagogue, and as the, as the practice was, the tradition, they would stand up, a man would stand up and read from the scripture. And this day, you know, the, the scripture wasn't in a book, it was in scrolls, it was the Torah, and he asked for the book of Isaiah. Now, now bear in mind, the people there understood what he's talking about because all the young Jewish boys by that time, you know, they, they come to age, they've already memorized the first five books of the Bible, but also the law and the prophets. And so he asked for Isaiah 61, and he stands up and reads these words, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blinds, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. <clears throat> if you read all of Isaiah 61, it, it, it's an amazing revelation of the heart of God. The first message Jesus gets up and talks about is about the poor. <clears throat> the, last verse, the last message Jesus delivers in Matthew 25, but before we go there, I want to go to Mark 10. In the 10th chapter of Mark, is one of the two times that Jesus was asked the question, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Two times it happens in the Bible. It's in Mark 10 and Luke 10. Easy to remember that way. If someone walks up to you and asks you that question, being a good evangelical Christian, we would probably get our four spiritual laws out read them to them, or we could use the EE approach and ask them if they died right now, do they know they get to go to heaven? Or there's the Romans Road, which I think comes out of the Thompson Chain Bible. There, or we could get Romans 10, 9, and 10 out and give them the message if you confess with your mouth. And do, but you know what? That isn't what Jesus did. Curious, huh? Two times he's asked. Two times he responds about the poor. Weird, huh? What did he do? He says, this, this guy that's this rich guy, now he comes up to Jesus, and, and again, I, I like to encourage you to look at this as a real story about real people in a real place. It's not just a made-up story. There's really a guy, there's really Jesus, and there's really people around, and it's outside. And the guy comes out, and he says he got down on his knees in front of him, and ask him these questions. Well, I can deduce from that that this guy wasn't just walking by this, down the street and saw Jesus, but that he had indeed been observing him and saw who he was and the way his life was operating and what was going on around him. It's called the kingdom. When we read about the kingdom in the Bible, and I, I'm including me in the picture here with you, and I'm going to make a big generalization, but I'll bet you, I'll bet you I'm right. We think and read about the kingdom, it's always the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is a place off somewhere out there. And boy, thank God when it's all, we're going there. And, 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 and it is part of the deal, but you know what? It's not the deal. It isn't. It's a byproduct of the deal. It's part of the deal. Jesus said, I came to give you life. Where are you alive? You're alive right now. He said, and then he prayed that famous prayer that everybody quotes, and he says, your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? On earth, On earth as it is in heaven. It's about now. Jesus Christ is about right now. Right where you live. Right where you work right where your issues are and your problems. Do you have any problems? It's an indication of something, you know. You're not dead. They're the only ones that don't have them. The rest of us do. Jesus came to give us life here and now. It's a reality. It's a truth. But when we think in terms of like everything is about you know, getting our ticket to heaven, we, we miss, we can easily miss what God's saying to us, what the life of Jesus was saying to us, because he came to empower you and live in you right now. The kingdom of heaven isn't here, it's not there, it's in us. And it's where God rules, and it's the way God operates. 